afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's monthly conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I'm Ron Granary, all of us at FPRI. Thank you for joining us live on Zoom and recorded on the FPRI YouTube page. Are leaders born or made? If they are made, how do we make them? These aren't new questions, but it's always exciting when one finds new answers. Steve Leonard has been on the hunt for new answers to these questions for some time now. He has studied leadership development from both conventional and unconventional angles. Author, co-author, or editor of 10 books and numerous articles, blog posts and podcasts on strategy and leadership, as well as being a main contributor to the U.S. Army Field Manual 307 Stability Operations, which I know is continuing to fly off the shelves everywhere from Leavenworth to Leavenworth. Um, he has also explored the connection between popular culture and leadership. In two volumes, To Boldly Go, Leadership, Strategy, and Conflict in the 21st Century and Beyond, and most recently in Power Up, Leadership, Character, and Conflict Beyond the Superhero Multiverse. Leonard has brought together international teams of authors to consider what fiction can teach us about the facts of leadership. Leonard is also the creator of Doctrine Man, a defense and national security microblog slash comic strip with nearly 200,000 followers across social media platforms and more than 2 million unique weekly visitors. In every variation, Steve and his collaborators have encouraged readers to see lessons in a variety of texts and examples. Former FPRI president Alan Luxenberg often repeated the quote that a good historian makes the unfamiliar familiar, while a great historian makes the familiar unfamiliar. By examining familiar stories more closely, Steve Leonard and his colleagues take us into new worlds and help us build the tools to face the challenges those new worlds will provide. So where do we find leadership lessons? How do we find the power within? And how do we live up to the responsibilities power imposes on us? These questions and yours will guide us in conversation with Steve Leonard, a former Army strategist who retired as a colonel. Steve Leonard is currently Senior Assistant Dean and Professor of Practice at the University of Kansas School of Business, and we are delighted to have him with us this afternoon on People, Politics, and Prose. Welcome, Steve Leonard. Thanks for having me, Ron. Great to be here. It's going to be it's going to be fun. It's 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 been uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation. So. Steve and I are going to start talking, but we encourage those of you who are um, out there in TV land to uh, use their put their quotes in or their questions in using the Q&A feature on the webinar um, rather than the chat box. Um, and we will be off and running. So, so Steve, what uh, to, to start with the most recent book, um, what inspired you uh, and your colleagues who co-edited with you to come up with the ideas for for Power Up? So that's a, that's a great question. And to answer that question, you've got to look at uh, 10 year old me who completely um, absorbed in um, a copy of The Amazing Spider Man uh, 101. And I used that as a recent example of, uh, of how that, that spawned this, this effort. And it really was the initial urge to do this. It's it's a it's it's one where uh, Marvel introduces Morbius, the living vampire, somebody who had uh, had uh, health afflictions that he tried to cure through experimentation. And on the other side of the coin, you have Peter Parker, who doesn't want the power that he has and takes a serum to remove his powers and instead grows four more arms. And and so this whole the, the whole conflict across this comic is really about two people trying to come to grips with who they are in different ways. And, and there's, there's issues of ethics, there's issues of power. Um, there's issues of how we lead, how we think, how we, how we make decisions. All this stuff comes to play in 36 pages. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it was, it was an issue that I picked up for a penny at a used bookstore, tore through it, that that kind of a thing that that kind of a phenomenon rested in the back of my head for okay let's just say 50 years um sure and every every marvel comic every dc comic, every comic i read that, that had that kind of a, a dynamic with the story would 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 reside with me and and it would nag at me that there's a narrative there 
that allows us to look at situations in life that maybe are too uncomfortable to just say, hey, let's talk about Ron and Steve and Steve's problems or Ron's problems. No, I said, let's talk about Peter Parker's problems, who have very similar problems. And then it puts us into a safe space where we can discuss these issues and maybe in a less controversial way um, with, that, that draws less emotion and you actually increase the empathy there. Um, that all those stories out there they have inspired people in different ways to look at problems through a different lens. And so we thought when it, when it came time to do this and we were on the, on the, I think, I don't even think to boldly go had published yet. And we reached out to the publisher and said, I have an idea. And, and our editor immediately said, Hey, you know, I lost my husband, you know, this many years ago and Spider-Man got them through. <laughs> and that was it. It's like, we found something that touches people and touches everybody in a different way that, that falls into this, into this genre that follows the genre. And so it was easy to say, Hey, let's do this. Let's pull a team together. Uh, and let's see what people think and what people right. have to say. And what you found was this really diverse, like you said, an international group, a diverse international group of people who all had something to say about something in the superhero genre that had affected them or influenced them in some way and that they could peel back the onion on that genre and really go deep into how it impacted them, how it helped them resolve issues, or how you know we as a society can look at these kinds of things and find our own answers. And uh, you've read the book, so you know exactly how all those voices come to bear and what they bring to the table. It's just absolutely amazing to watch it unfold. This exploded in a way that we never anticipated. Right. Um, well, I mean, we get some nerdy stories about how much I like Batman, but <clears throat> you really got some great stories about, you know, leadership, character, ethics, diversity. Um, it all it all came out in, in, in a beautiful right. way. Now, I, and, 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 you know, full disclosure, right, I am one of the authors in uh, in in uh, Power Up. Uh, and uh, and so it's been fun to be in the group. I was I was lucky enough to be have a chance to review the first volume to boldly go about science fiction, uh, and and it, it struck me then right what an interesting bunch of people and you know uh, as somebody who teaches at the U.S. Army War College although I, I have to give the standard disclaimer right that my any opinions I express here are not those of the U.S. Army War College the U.S. Army uh, or the Department of Defense um, I don't think anybody would much want to claim my opinions anyway but the um but i remember being impressed by the number of people who were making this contrib contribution to the first volume and then into this one who are involved in <clears throat> excuse me who are involved in uh leadership training who are involved in professional military education right people who think very seriously about questions of leadership and who are willing to apply those serious thoughts to let's say their other enthusiasms in a way that allows them to reach a broader audience and so this idea you know, Rod Serling famously said when he when he explained why he made the Twilight Zone, <clears throat> is he said, you know, that um, it's easier to get across serious messages um, if they don't come out of the mouths of a Republican or a Democrat, but out of a Martian, um, because you know you're able yep. to sort of grab people with the story. You can show complexity, but um, but in a way that creates enough distance that people are actually willing to hear the discussion about complexity without feeling like they got to take a side. Um, and so would, would you say, and I don't want to drift too deep into nerddom here, although I'd be happy to do it, but is <laughs> Spider-Man, because we were, we were talking beforehand and we're not going to, we're not going to out my colleague at the Foreign Policy Research Institute who, um, had an unconventional choice for her favorite superhero. We'll leave that aside, but I'm going to ask you, Steve, is Spider-Man your favorite superhero? Uh, I don't know. You probably can't see behind me. I have three different versions of Spider-Man <laughs> hanging in my office window, but um, Spider-Man was the first superhero for me. Yeah. Uh, well, actually the second, because I actually grew up watching the original Batman TV series, but I didn't think about Batman in the same way. Cause that was very yeah. campy, very, you know, uh, you get a lot of pop culture references out of that. And that's kind of where it stops. Spider-Man was the first one to introduce real lessons to me as a kid mm -hmm. and being the the little skinny kid with glasses who was really into science and math, I could relate directly to Peter Parker and and what he had to put up with from others. And mm -hmm. that, that characterization really resonated with me. But if you look around the rest of the office, my office is a is a shrine to the superhero genre. 
You have, uh, I have a shelf above me with the X-Men on it. I have Avengers here. I have monsters over here. I have a full-size uh, Iron Man Hall of Armor on a shelf up behind me. Uh, and, and so one of my, one of my favorite things to do is to collect insanely expensive action figures that are true collectibles and I have nowhere to put them, but in my office because I'm not allowed to put them anywhere else in the house. So my office is just this collection of stuff. And that's what really what it comes down to. I got Iron Man, I got Captain America, I got, you know, the Ant-Man, the Wasp here, Age of Apocalypse people up here. I mean, I get all that stuff. Interesting. And, or in the closet that I don't have room for. So if you ever want to put up a display in your office, let me know. I I can we can arrange a museum. You can arrange loan. some things. This is good. I we yeah. work out the loan. I'll get little tags, right, from the the uh the Leonard Museum of of uh nerdy nerddom. Nerd Just go ahead and say it. It's Just okay. Well, I mean, because the idea about you know which superhero appeals, right? Spider Man's really important, right? Because he is yeah. uh he's a working class hero, right? He's not he's not a rich uh you know, he's not a billionaire who's decided to fight crime in his spare time, um, who lives in a stately mansion and has a bat cave underneath him, or he's not Tony Stark, the head of Stark Industries, right? In fact, one of the early Spider Man comics I remember reading had Parker remembering he had to go take an exam um at queen's oh, college yeah, and absolutely. having to rush and and the stress of of having to sit and write and he he uh, i i remember this as, as clear as day there's a picture of him he breaks the, the the tip of his ballpoint pen and then he crushes the pen in his hand and gets up and walks out of the room right he just can't take the stress of taking an exam right this is a guy who's going to fight the green goblin later on but he can't uh he can't get his, his act together to take an exam and so the idea of somebody who is uh, a real person who is dealing with real problems with, you know, what's his direction in life. Right. Uh, and, um, and also now has this enormous power, which brings responsibility with it. Um, I, what, uh, so, but you went with science fiction first and to boldly go. And so um, was that, did that feel like uh, an easier step into the discussion of leadership because because I remember in, the, in 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 To Boldly Go, right, you mentioned how so many science fiction stories ultimately are about war and struggle and all this kind of stuff. And so it feels like you can move more quickly into discussions of leadership and strategy. Is that what led you with To Boldly Go to get into that first? There's actually a, I wouldn't say it's a more complicated answer, but To Boldly Go came on the heels of two similar efforts that we did with uh, some some of the uh, team from the Modern War Institute. We did Strategy Strikes Back with huge Star Wars as the metaphor for exploring different issues. And then we went on to Game of Thrones with winning Westeros. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been an advocate for expanding beyond the Star Wars universe and, and doing science fiction broadly. We needed to. I thought there was so much more that we didn't dig into that we limited ourselves by just staying with a single show yeah, um, or a single uh, series. And uh, that team kind of went their way. Uh, John and I had talked, John Klug and I had talked at length um, about where we could go next. And we were talking with Mick Ryan and... Um, we literally just did nothing more than send an email to the, our publisher before we had a publisher and just kind of throw the idea out. And they said, absolutely, yes, we'll write the proposal. Don't worry about it. Um, and John and I had talked for a long time about at the, the fascination with uh, the Battle of the Mutara Nebula from uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and how that battle really brought to head, uh, is it experience or is it intellect? And and where those two come together and um, can you teach leadership? Can you, know, are you born with it? And all those different things that you explore, that was a battle that kind of lays all that bare against uh, using space as a metaphor for the sea battle. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It was absolutely great. And that was the impetus for, hey, let's do this much more broadly. And then as we started to dig into the idea, you know, we started to find all kinds of other things to talk about. Uh, Ender's Game. Uh, right. I wrote about Rod Serling and Planet of the Apes. You I mean, sure I was, did. I, was, I had started with an idea of Planet of the Apes as a metaphor for other things. And got Beware so deep the beast man. 
beware the beast man, right? That's the oh, title of your essay, right? Which is the great absolutely. line. That's what the apes are taught, right? To beware the beast. Oh, man. absolutely. And, but, 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 you know, you get getting back to your initial point earlier about, you know, that gives you a space to talk about issues where it's safe, where mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. feel far mm -hmm. more comfortable talking about the dangers of mankind in a fictional universe than they do in day-to-day -day life. You right. can explore issues of climate. You can explore issues of, uh, you name it. You can go anywhere. Put right. them on Put them on Mars. Put them somewhere else. You could talk about these things all day long, and people get lost in the metaphor. Right. Well, and and the, the, the way that you put that is so so uh, apropos because it was, you know, on the one hand, right, these are you have heroes, you have struggle. So people begin to identify. But if they stop and they think about the bigger questions that are being raised, it makes the whole story much more, uh, much more complicated, much richer. So it makes both the fiction richer, but it also makes the real life lessons of the fiction more valuable. Because right? the, the, the biggest thing about Planet of the Apes, right, spoiler alert for anybody who is, uh, hasn't seen yet a movie that is as old as I am, um, uh, which, as my son will tell you, is very old indeed. Um, no. the, what the, the kicker at the end of Planet of the Apes is after you think that you're in some kind of completely uh, uh, fantasy land disconnected from reality, you are brought right back into realiz realizing that the Planet of the Apes is Earth. Um, and that, uh, and there's a reason why. Classic twist right? at the end. Totally. Right. And yeah. that, that there, there's a reason why the apes are, and Dr. Zayas in particular, is so concerned about making sure that uh, uh, human beings who can talk, men who can talk, are kept out of public eye because they know what men are capable of doing. Yeah. And, but I will also say, for those of you, you should all read To Boldly Go, that one of the things that comes across in there as well is you have even an, an excellent and learned essay on Mel Brooks's Spaceballs. And about how Dark Helmet's cartoonish villainy is actually a very interesting metaphor for thinking about how how bad bad leadership can be, um, which I thought was a uh, it, it comes near the end of the book, and it uh, it's you know you think we've talked about everything possible, and here you have somebody talking about space balls, and that even there you can find a serious lesson about leadership, which <laughs> it's, that still gets me. Um, so you know, nice work there. Hey. I didn't write that specific part, but it was right. it was a it was a great chapter, right? And and right. not ironic at all, the fact that Mel Brooks's son also wrote a chapter in that book. Exactly right. You know, so and 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 you know this because I think about this. I think about with to boldly go and with power up, that you know if if we're looking for sort of literary antecedents, right? You know, Dan Dresner's um, book on IR theory and zombies, um, uh, and um, and even Max Brooks's original book, World War Z, which tries to imagine the 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 practical real world geopolitical impact of a zombie outbreak. Um, that you know, as we as we sort of think about try to try to figure out how do we manage those boundaries between the completely fictional and the possibly real. Um, it's it's an interesting ongoing process. It is. Um, and so now, there's a bunch of different ways I want to go with this, but I'm going to ask this basic question that I hinted at at the beginning, right? You work at a, you work at a business school now. You were a strategist. You wore the uniform for uh, for a good long time. And uh, and uh, can leadership be taught, Steve? So I, absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a firm believer that you can grow people. The do you are you born with a certain capacity? I think we're all born as empty vessels, and what you put in that vessel determines what you become. Mm -hmm. uh, that handicaps some people who don't grow up in the right environments. But I mean, I look at it like this. I uh, one of the classes I teach as a as a professor is I teach uh, strategic management uh, as a capstone class to our seniors. Mm. And so I, you know, I have these these kids come in. They're finance majors. They're HR majors. They're accounting majors. You take it. I teach those students. We start off with uh, design methodology. I don't call it design methodology, but we mm -hmm. teach design methodology before we do anything else. And we talk about problem framing, the need for, for identifying the problem so you know that you're solving the right problem before you put too much intellectual effort into it. Uh, framing the environment, understanding you know what, what the competitive environment looks like. And I put this all in the context of business, but you know, we spend probably the first six weeks doing nothing but going through cognitive issues 
Um, how do you think? How do you make decisions? How do you lead as a decision maker? Uh, before we dig into the strategic part, it's like how mm-hmm. the mind works and what do you do? Um, as far as I know, I'm the only person who teaches it that way. But I, but if I do nothing else, I like to think that at the end of 16 weeks that I spark that curiosity and, and they, and they continue that education and they continue to ask those questions. Um, a lot of us just fundamental things that you probably teach at the war college too. It's right. how you think, how you decide, how you ask questions, how you, how you raise the level of thought and then translate that to your, your ability to see, interpret, and then make dis- decisions within a, a highly competitive environment, a highly competitive world. Um, you absolutely can teach people to do that. It sure. takes a lot of iterations. It's like anything else. Um, you know, I'd love to be a guitar player, but I know it's going to take me a long time, but I could. I, I just have to be patient and go through it. Le- you've got to put in the repetitions. You've got to create the situations, the scenarios where they're forced into uh, situations where they have to make decisions, where they have to react. Um, and the more you do that, the better they become in the moment and the better they become at thinking through these things. So absolutely, mm-hmm. it can be taught. Did the army teach you to become a leader? Uh, you know, I, yeah, I would say yes, in a, in a lot of ways. Um, it, there's, there's, it's, it's, my father taught me a certain way of thinking and, uh, how to use your, how, how to think strategically uh, that definitely that came from my dad, mm-hmm. but also how to use your work ethic to create opportunity for yourself. Um, I, I had the benefit of being, um, part of an ROTC program at college, the University of Idaho, where we literally trained and trained and trained. And I really didn't like what we did until I was on active duty. And I realized that all that training had produced in me, all those repetitions had produced in me a a level of tactical expertise and decision-making ability that um, I think put me head and shoulders above my peers to start with, which was a good thing. I needed that uh, yeah. because God knows my decision-making ability was skewed. I was somebody who didn't hesitate to take risk when maybe I shouldn't have been taking a risk. Uh, but it gave me it gave me an opportunity where I could be more competitive and uh, be more successful early on. Um, and all that grew through early experience with the Army. And then it was just honed. And I was very fortunate to be surrounded by people who had a lot of experience, who were willing to share those experiences and those observations and give me good feedback and give me opportunities and allow me to make mistakes. Right. Which in our, in our, in our generation, there was not a lot of allowing our subordinates to make mistakes. I was really lucky. I don't think I was, I think I was a major before I worked for somebody who did not underwrite mistakes. And so I had 10, 12 years under my belt of doing that. And that really honed how I made decisions, how I used my subordinates, how I allowed my subordinates to, you know, have some freedom of maneuver. Um, yeah. So the, did the army make me a leader? Absolutely. Yeah. No question about it. Well, and, and the idea of repetition, and of course you ended up writing doctrine, right? Do you, oh, I yeah. think you don't really know about this. Thought. So I want I want to talk I want to take a minute to talk because I think especially for uh, for those for those people in the audience who've either not worked in PME or not served in the military, um, what does what goes into writing a volume like uh, uh, you know, like that page Turner Army Field Manual three three dash oh seven so stability there, operations there, there, there were today it's it's probably a little bit different but I mm-hmm. I, I came to the doctrine world about two thousand four. Uh, it was my first post KD job as a field grade. Um, I wanted to go teach. No, we're going to rewrite FM 30 and we need a group of SAMS graduates to to pull that together. And so SAMS I, being uh, the school of advanced military studies. Yep, for those I, I ended up spending four years with that team and then led the team through publication. Um, but there was a lot that went into it. Mm-hmm. We spent a lot of time working with uh, the scene, the most senior leaders in the military, uh, in the army, looking at different issues, people developing white papers. So it was a very formalized process, uh, a little too formalized for me. I, I, I kind of like to freewheel a little bit more than that. 
um, but a lot of intellectual thought, uh, a lot of exposure to some of the biggest names in our history, um, uh, militarily, in, in our army, uh, a lot of uh, airland battle veterans that really understood what combined arms maneuver was um, and, and the importance of coordination and synchronization uh, to making that work and, and the, the type of systems thinking you had to have to be able to pull that off. Really fascinating stuff. The timeline was about four years, which I thought was long, but a great effort, a lot of exposure, a lot of thought. Uh, you never think about things in quite the same way as often as you do. Uh, during that process, um, somebody realizes right around the time of the surge, and somebody said, you know what we don't have? We have this great coin manual. We're working on 3.0. But what do you do post-invasion? You got to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, that was in the midst of when nation building was a big discussion. And uh, General Petraeus had called me into his office uh, like one Saturday uh, when he was the commander of Fort Leavenworth and said, hey, I want you to go meet with a group of our interagency partners and start working this. And I didn't know anybody. I, you know, let's start, let's start networking from scratch. And in the end, we pulled together a team that reflected all the agencies of the government, including we brought in non-governmental organizations. We brought in international uh, representation and pulled all that together. And we did that in 10 and a half months, which was unheard of in terms of how you develop doctrine. And it really was a pedal to the metal effort where we would meet, we would we would talk about what needs to go in there. Okay, let's develop the framework. Um, let's take that framework. Let's start to add meat to the bones. Let's get feedback. Do we have it right? Do we not have it right? Um, and um, then get input from all those agencies, all those stakeholders, get them to provide input, but do it on a much shorter time frame. So where it was typical for developing a regular manual to take 45 to 60 days to provide feedback, I can give people about two weeks. And my thinking was, you're going to wait till the end anyway, right? So I give you 60 <laughs> days, you're going to wait till you got 45 <laughs> days in, and then you're going to hand jam a bunch of stuff and send it to me. So how about we just cut those 45 days off when I give you 15 days up front? And I was told, well, that's not how it works. Well, I think we can make this work. And it worked just fine. People got a little grumpy at first. Oh, I, I need more time. Like you have two weeks. That's it. Two weeks. Let's get her done. And we did that. We turned probably three or four iterations of the manual that quickly got the feedback, put all the feedback in, pop something out a couple of weeks later, a month later, boom, here we go. Here's all the revisions. And we continued to do that right up until publication. Uh, and that manual uh, ended up being the foundation for uh the guiding principles for stability operations for the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. that, that led exactly to that. You know, we used right. the Army's manual as a as a platform, as a springboard to move on to, hey, now we're going to do this across the entire government. And for starting that off in about 2007 and not knowing anybody, it's funny that we're now 16 years later and I'm still in touch with all of those people. See, that's and we still converse on a regular basis, although less and less about stability operations and more <laughs> and more about uh, you know, I'm building a cabin in in Connecticut. Oh, that's nice. That's life management. Well, but that that's idea fun. about build about building teams, that leadership is not just an individual activity, right? It's it's figuring out who you can work with and then how you're going to work with them. And and that I think is something that comes across in your uh, let's say in in your in your other writings, um, and especially you um, those people who follow you on uh, LinkedIn, for example, write your essays that are that come out through clearance jobs about leadership. That um, uh, James Montgomery has a question here about your article on destructive leadership tendencies, and he would like to solicit your opinions on the concept of fear and a leader's inability to contend with possible negative outcomes of decisions. Because I think about that, right? Your decision to say, hey, let's let's go ahead and take a risk and give everybody two weeks, right? If it if it only takes a minute at the last minute, right? Why not why not push the last minute up, I guess. So but James has a great point here. And yeah. and that's uh that's something and I don't know that I covered that under you know, the destructive leadership. I tangentially I did mm -hmm. uh the reluctance for people to make decisions. Um uh, this was something I had experienced personally that, that 
just I don't know if it's a generational thing. I don't know if it's an individual thing, but I think it grew kind of out of that zero defect mentality that we used to talk about in the nineties yeah. where you had, you developed in my mind, there was a, there was a generation of leaders that uh, got ahead by not taking risks and not making mistakes. And that translated into people who couldn't make decisions because they knew that if they made decisions that they ran the risk of being held accountable if those decisions went sideways. Um, and there's other articles that I wrote that dealt with that specifically. The the, the fear of making a decision uh, because you're going to be held accountable for the results mm -hmm. and um, the, the need to get past that. And maybe that was because those were people who were never, they never had leaders that they worked for that underwrote mistakes or never allowed them to make mistakes. I don't know. Maybe it's a personal personality thing. Um, but it drives to me, um, that specific thing drove me to write something in the 2008 FM 30. It's almost lost to time, but there's a quote in there about, um, uh, risk was a potent catalyst to fuel opportunity. And if you talk about, uh, doctrine, a lot of times we have in doctrine where we'll talk about uh, you creating and exploiting opportunity and mm -hmm. you don't, mm -hmm. uh, don't gain opportunity without taking risk. And so you had to understand the interdependence and the interrelationship with risk and opportunity. You had to get over the fear and you had to be willing to make decisions that put you at risk and then just accept that risk. Mm -hmm. um, I still do that today. I make decisions for the people that work for me um, and I allow them to make mistakes and I provide the overhead cover. I underwrite those mistakes. I let them make mistakes knowing that I've got it. If something goes sideways, I'll take responsibility for it. You're not going to suffer as a result. Um, that grows out of that, that leadership experience that you're not afraid to take risks. You're, you, you overcome the fear. Right. And, um, that grew out of, honestly, uh, my job in college, I was a, I worked my way through college as a firefighter and I, I worked for a fire chief who, if he saw one sign of fear, he would yank you by the back of your pants and, <laughs> and that would be it. You'd be done. You right. cannot show fear. You had to learn how to deal with fear. And so a lot of how I dealt with risk and dealt with the fear of making decisions grew from working in a job for four or five years where you were doing things that were antithetical to yeah. human yeah. nature. I'm going to walk into a fire. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to deal with it. And, and how you look at fear becomes completely different. And, and so that translates later on into how I make decisions. And frankly, sometimes that I would make decisions that were probably stupid decisions because I wasn't afraid of the risk. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to make this decision and then I'll deal with it. Um, you know, you do what you do. And there's stories stupid. behind that too, but I'm not going to go into all that. I saw you have another question. I do. Well, but I was also thinking is this made me think exactly of Han Solo saying, don't ever tell me the odds. Oh right? yeah. It's like, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't need odds. to know. I don't need to know. I know it's risky, but that's all I need to know. And the rest <laughs> I'm going to do. Um, I am re related to this is the, uh, that Chester Nimitz ran a ship aground when he was a young commander and yep. still managed to become Admiral Chester Nimitz. Right. And you can't imagine that happening in a, in an, op, in an enterprise that yeah. would be right. I mean, he would have, he would have been sailing a desk and, and then retired, retired. Um, and so yeah. the idea that you let people make mistakes so that they can grow from them. Um, that's, that's a hard thing. It's a hard thing as a leader to be willing to let that happen. Right. Cause you're always afraid. Like, I don't, it's, it's one thing you're worried about your subordinates uh, careers. It's another thing is what I want my subordinates to mess things up for me. Right. So that's the fear is a, is a, is a two-way street, right? The subordinates are afraid to make mistakes because they'll look bad. And the commander makes clear he's not going to tolerate mistakes because he doesn't want himself to look bad. You need yeah, to be I braver. Think that, that whole, that whole dynamic plays out. You have to trust that one, that your people will learn from their mistakes, mm. but there are mistakes and there are mistakes. There are, um, you know, I I kept the guys out too late at the firing range and they slept in through PT. That's a mistake we can yeah. live with. Right. I went out to the firing range with the guys. We left three weapons on the range. We went back out this morning. They're not there. That's not a mistake you can live with. That's and so there problem. are degrees of mistakes. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, that's a that's what I went through. I do I go through that even today. 
yeah. uh, with people that I've had people say, well, you didn't let me make a mistake. I'm like, I let you make a mistake, but there are mistakes and there are mistakes. You make, when you make a mistake that like affects somebody else significantly, uh, yeah, that's, that's a, that's not a, and you continue to make that mistake. Yeah. You're not learning. So I'm not going to waste time. If you're not going to learn from it. That is fair. That is a fair statement. So yes, Fritz Heinzen does have a question about anti-heroes. Um, and he's asking if any of his favorites uh, show up in the book in particular. Uh, in other words, the Sphinx, Alexander Dane, Severus Snape, Grandmaster, or even, uh, Fritz mentions perhaps not necessarily my hero, but a, a role model for us all, Frank Drebin from uh, The Naked Gun. So a, oh the, he the, the hero or the non-heroic hero, right? The I'm thinking Frank Drebin, Jacques Clouseau, um, uh, <laughs> Maxwell Smart. Definitely there. Um, there's that the final chapter of the book that deals with, 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 with where uh, where monsters dwell. Um uh, talks about anti-heroes, but more from a monster's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that, that they become interesting because what they do is they show that inside all of us there are things that maybe aren't right, uh or we make mistakes that there's redemption, that we can redeem ourselves, that we can prove value. Um, the whole idea that Fritz mentions, the anti-heroes had to be in there because they're still heroes. Right. Um, my chapter, I focused on man thing. You've got uh, other chapters, the last book, people talk about Darth Vader. Um, you, you have to cover the anti-heroes. You can't just cover the ones that are easy. You got to pick the hard the hard ones out too. And I want to give a quick shout out to Fritz because the Sphinx is absolutely my favorite uh, anti-hero. I, I still really? I look at the Sphinx as the Sphinx in my mind was always a take on uh, Sun Tzu. Okay. But a comedic take on Sun Tzu. And I have always used sphinx quotes in my strategy class with my undergrads even though they're all too young none of them have ever seen it they don't appreciate it for what it is the pure genius of that film mm -hmm. um but this is this nobody, is mystery man no one about. character yeah. is as good as the sphinx in that in that film uh i can watch that film over and over just for the sphinx and just this for his good. lines see this is this is very good well and i i, I like i like fritz also mentions uh severus snape from uh, from the Harry Potter stories. And I think about Severus Snape is a perfect example of somebody that you think is a villain. Like from the very first moment yeah. you meet him, you're convinced he's a villain until you get all the way to the end of the story and you find out that he's essentially been undercover the whole time. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, a, that's an interesting, that's a, that's a, you know, that, that, that building a story arc like that is very difficult. Oh, you think how much time she put into that story arc. She probably knew early on he would be the hero in the end. And right. and she doesn't hint at it. She maybe we should have seen it coming because anybody that bad that long, you know they gotta be a good guy, right? You just know they're gonna turn out to be a good guy. <laughs> right. But she, you know, it, it still it was great. Uh and these are all these are all wonderful characters. Um uh and you can't miss the fact that you got Alan Rickman on here twice. Uh, I would also say Alan Rickman's character in Dogma also qualifies in, as, a, as a great anti-hero. Uh, that was the first time I absolutely fell in love with Alec Rickman, uh, Alan Rickman as, a, as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, again, an unappreciated role for a lot of people, uh, but, but a great film. See, and and so this idea, right, is, is when, when you're trying to, if heroes... If heroes are individuals that we admire, right, and you try to find or or that that who attract our uh, attention, right, and and pull us out of our daily experience, right, that it is people can do that or uh, characters can do that in a variety of ways, right. They can do that by doing great things. Yeah. They can do it by being complicated and interesting. Uh, and and so I, I think about that, and and you know because one of the raps on superhero movies. Uh, these days, right, is that they're essentially simplified because they are geopolitically they're they're easier to sell worldwide. They're they're less likely to upset anybody because they don't talk about real politics. Um, do, what um, is there a is there a superhero film or film series that you think does a good job of getting at important questions? 
um, without without oversimplifying or without trivializing them. Oh my God. Um, that is a tough question. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't expecting that one. So let me think. That's through, okay. I, some, some of them I'm come to me when we're talking. Different... So let me answer this question this way, is that there is a rich depth of narrative there that um, the studios can pick up on and use. And, mm -hmm. and there's no there's no mistaking they they you're talking decades and decades of, of narrative i think although the films kind of they go up they go down i have always felt that the x-men was the franchise to really dig into our differences as human beings mm -hmm. and and that is it, it is simplified in a certain way and but it's the fundamental question of can we accept each other mm -hmm. and can we deal with the differences among ourselves? Uh, and, but and it also pulls in the whole Magneto thing that, okay, is he a bad guy or is he the product of his environment and his upbringing? Um, it's not always clear. Yeah. Um, the problem with that franchise is, is that it bounces around a lot. Um, and sometimes it just becomes a stupid, you know, let's tell a story. And it's, it's not, my example would be when they did the age of apocalypse, which mm -hmm. the age of apocalypse is a brilliant storyline that digs probably deeper into that whole thing, that whole, that whole genre, uh, than any other story in recent memory, probably in the last 20 or 30 years, it was a six month storyline, uh, X-Men Alpha, X-Men Omega, and then in between all the stories and all the, the story arcs. And you try to jam that into a two-hour crappy movie. <laughs> you, and it's like, okay, at that point, you lost it. You know, you had an opportunity to do this right, but you didn't. Um, but the, but overall, I think they do a really great job of, of treating the human condition and dealing with the differences that we all see amongst each other. Um, I like that. Uh, I don't think it comes out so much in the rest of those movies. There's other things and probably in a much broader scale um, that we have to deal with. Uh, but yeah. Um, two nerdy questions. I want to ask a fellow uh, superhero nerd and get them on, get you on the record on this. One is um, why do you think the Spider-Man movies have such a hard time dealing with the character of Gwen Stacy? And why do they fall back always on Mary Jane Watson as the main love interest? I have a problem with this, which we could talk I do about too. off, off camera. I, I have always had a problem with this. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I think you have to, they started to get at this when they, when they killed off um, Gwen Stacy's father, mm. Captain Stacy. Yeah. That was, there's a very limited story arc that you can do with Gwen Stacy Mary Jane was always in the background, but Mary Jane became a much more complicated character later on. Uh, and then, and that, that, that part of Peter's life is less interesting to a lot of people. Um, that is always tough to do when you cross the line and start to bring in um, romantic relationships yes. into a story arc, it confuses things. Um, my personal example of how to do it wrong is the Fantastic Four. Because as much as I tried to read the Fantastic Four as a kid, I loved Jack Kirby's storytelling, but I could not stand the inner relationship between Sue and Reed Richards. It was boring. Yes. <laughs> You're the smartest guy in the world. You cannot remember to pay your mortgage. How can you be the smartest man in the world and not remember to pay your bills? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Um, and really, you only end up watching and reading for the interplay between the thing and the human torch, which is great. Yes. I don't want to watch little kids. I don't want to watch people kiss. No, I don't want to watch any of the rest of that stuff. It's not interesting. <laughs> I can go read a Harlequin romance if I want that stuff. I want a different, you know, that I want the hero, the hero villain story. I want to dig into human nature. I want to get into the cognitive sciences. I don't want to watch romance well and, and and especially right because we have to say is it's unfair to sue storm that she is she is relegated to the oh, yeah. complicated wife rather than allowed to be a hero on her own right which is unfair to her who is an interesting yeah. 
And in the movies, it was even worse because all yeah. she was was the lady who would like sweat and 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 make sh- like force fields. That got that was really exciting. Okay, yeah. you can do so much more, but you're not going to. We're going to relegate you to to being the complicated spouse. See, that's yeah. okay. So that's I'm I'm glad I'm glad that's we got nerd that question out. number one. Nerd question number two: Why are the Marvel movies better than the DC movies? Okay, so we talk about this in class. I actually do yes. a case study, Ooh. both the graduate and the undergraduate level on this. And uh, Harvard Business Review has a really good case study on this. Um, it comes down to strategy. Ooh, both right. both uh, publishers have a, an incredibly rich narrative that they can draw on. Um, the difference becomes in how you pull that together. And Kevin Feige has always used what he calls a wheel. And the wheel ties together the characters, their storylines, their interplay, all that. And so every movie has to uh, has to be tied together with the wheel. You couldn't create something. The complaint becoming then, well, the directors don't have enough freedom. But mm-hmm. there's you have to balance between freedom and the quality of the storyline and the ability to stay true to some form of narrative. Um, that's a that's an incredibly difficult thing to do, but you have to have a strategy behind it. You can't create one-off films, um, and DC is notorious for that. Great Batman movies, but when you try to pull in um, everything else, it doesn't always work. Uh, an example would be uh, the whole Death of Superman story arc. It's mm-hmm. a great story arc, but they screwed it up. Mm-hmm. They they didn't they didn't follow the story arc. They didn't even come close to it. Batman didn't have any role in that. Your desire to pull together the Justice League by using a completely separate storyline doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get where where they were trying to go with it, but it's faulty. And in the process, you really didn't pay enough attention to um, the the original storyline where Superman dies. Mm-hmm. which was a great storyline also uh, several i think it was a four or five month storyline back in the 90s um great storyline you had a story there you didn't have to create justice league you didn't have to go through the 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 controversy over the mustache uh the whole nine yards I me mean, screwed that up marvel is on the on the cusp of doing that right now it is, and this is one of those things that you have to sit back and watch. Um, do we trust that 10 years from now, we are going to look back on this phase of the Marvel franchise and say, oh, he had a plan the whole time. Hmm. Or are we going to look back and say, yeah, we lost it somewhere about 10 years ago and we never pulled things together very well. And I think that there's an argument to be made either way. Um you have made a series of one-off films that just don't quite fit and you don't know where they're going. Where if you went back to 2008 and you start with Iron Man 1, you had a fairly logical growth of characters, introduction of people. You did everything right and then pull it all together. It's tough to see right now. Well, um, it, and it's a hard act to follow. It's a hard act to follow, right? And that's the, it, it can be a real problem, right? You you created a series of films that culminated with the world being destroyed or half the people on earth being killed. Yeah. And then you brought those half people back to life and you defeated the creature that was going to destroy all of humanity and destroy the world. Um, why not just say, this is great. Let's go make movies about something else now. I mean, I guess I, I, I'm asking a guy who teaches in a business school yeah, that's, why this that's, is so, right? That's a, that's, a, that's an easy question to answer, right? So in, in the same vein, um, what are you going to do with Kang the Conqueror? Are you going to just create Thanos again? Are you going to go down the same road? Uh, these are the questions that John Nickham, my other co-editor, mm-hmm. John yes. works in the School of Journalism, uh, as a faculty member, John and I meet about every other week for coffee, and we end up having these conversations. Where are they going to go? What are they going to do? How are we going to get there? What's going to happen? Um, and it's a fascinating discussion, and we just don't know the answers yet. The right. real answer to how you make these movies is you've got to have a strategy. Mm-hmm. If DC had a strategy and they really thought it through, I think they've got enough narrative where they could um, they could compete much more effectively with Marvel. But then you create movies like Wonder Woman 1984, which was 
garbage and you create blue beetle which was moderate garbage um i watched the last aquaman movie and as much as i like jason momoa i don't know what they were doing with that right uh, it's just it's a series of one-offs and then you translate over to the Marvel Universe, and I think you're headed in the same direction. Um, when you introduce Prince Namor, that whole movie was like, mm, yeah, I'm not getting it. I just, I'm not sure I like this. And I realized that they made trade-offs to be able to create that film. But every trade-off then takes the fan and all of us who then says, that's not the way it was in the comic books. Right. You know, well, oh, and, well, we couldn't we couldn't introduce Namor as a white man. Namor's not a white man. He's a freaking sea man with pointed ears. He's a Vulcan, right. whatever. You, you can make you, him anything. You can't, you, you can't twist the narrative too much or you get something that's, that's that doesn't comport with what we all know and realize mm-hmm. and recognize. So well, and, that's and, why I, say, I think Marvel could be on the cusp of doing something either really good or really crappy. And we're probably about four or five years away from knowing where it's going to go. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, we are, we're, we're, we're getting down to the last 10 minutes and there's so many things that we could, so many directions we could go in. I wanted to ask you about doctrine, man. Um, so since as someone who's actually written doctrine, um, you know, of a lot about, let's say the seriousness and the absurdities of military life. Um, and uh, what role do you think humor plays in teaching, getting people think, getting people thinking about leadership and organizations for those people. I mean, and also how would you describe Dr. Man? I'm not going to, I'm not going to compare him to other comic strips because I think that's unfair to, well, I think it's unfair to you, but I can think of other workplace comic strips. Like were you inspired by the workplace comic strips when you decided to develop Dr. Man? Oh, actually, I don't know that there were any workplace comic strips at the time. There you go. This was we're talking. This was the mid two thousands. Um, the rest of those kind of followed, um, and so there, there's some interplay there. But what's interesting is Doctor Man is grew from a lot of different things. One mm-hmm. was the frustration, and that first question that we had kind of got to that. Mm-hmm. Um, the experience of working for somebody who struggles to make decisions, who struggles to do just about anything. That is very frustrating, and it brings out uh, a fairly dark sense of humor uh, because you got to be able to laugh at yourself to get through some of this stuff. And that's really where Doctrine Man exploded from the need to laugh at the uh, just sheer foolishness of some of the things that we do every day. And it doesn't matter whether you're writing Doctrine or whether you're working at the War College or whether you're sitting in the Pentagon. There, There's just a certain part of our life um that you wake up someday and and there's a comic that i i always joked because i actually saw this play out where i have a navy a navy officer running across the panels excited because he found a way to get a fifth quadrant on a quad chart and and that kind of thing is what you would deal with on a regular basis um I, I once submitted a concept plan uh, to the Army G3. Uh, God, this has probably been 11 years ago, maybe. And it got rejected. I followed the regulation to the letter, but it got rejected because, well, the Army G8 wanted, instead of the, the a written document, which is required by regulation, G8 wanted a PowerPoint. Oh, my and gosh. I, I doesn't say anywhere I have to do this in PowerPoint. But what it was do you assumed. want? Just, it was assumed you just needed to do it. Every page, make it a PowerPoint, like just bullet points for that page, and then just go through the whole document. Like, what if I say no? It'll never get through. We will make sure that concept plan goes nowhere. But the Army G3 wants a written document. The Army G8 insists on a PowerPoint on the same damn thing. That's the kind of stuff we have to learn to laugh at because that's our existence. Um, there's those little moments in life. Um, that are unique to us that we, we 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 need to be able to laugh at that because it's either you can laugh at it or you can scream at it take your pick and so doctor man kind of grew out of that years of dealing with that kind of thing and uh, for sanity's sake let's laugh instead mm-hmm. do you um, draw do you draw them yourself oh yeah uh mm-hmm. so and that, that's also a joke because every cartoon is created in powerpoint 
Right. So every character is a PowerPoint drawing, and that was that was a that was kind of like a subliminal gag that uh, you had. It took and that took a lot of work to create all these characters because some of them, I mean, now they're they're fairly detailed, name tags, uniform patterns, the whole nine yards. All that's created in PowerPoint, um, but it was part of the gag because you can't be you can't work for the government unless you know PowerPoint. And so PowerPoint had to be part of the gag. And the other gag was the anonymity of it, which mm -hmm. it wasn't that I stood up and waved a sign around and said, I'm doctor and man, I do the opposite. I just don't like right. the, I don't like the attention. So I don't, but I never, I never kept it a secret. And, and so that was kind of the gag was that it was a secret right underneath your nose. Anybody who knew me knew I, I did this. Um, there was no secret to it. But one of the things that I was thinking about this this morning, because somebody asked me about it, um, and how do your followers feel about knowing? I don't think my followers like to know. I think they like mm -hmm. to pretend it's still anonymous. And it's this weird thing that if if I cross the streams too closely between me as an individual and Dr. Man as a character, I think they get annoyed. Mm -hmm. and and they don't like it and um it just i can i can feel the reaction sometimes and the responses just that they don't want to know they want to pretend they want to pretend that clark kent's not superman let's just let's just leave let's it just that. pretend yeah. see let's and i gotta say more. right it, a perfect way to bring it all home is that you know it, it turns out that the essay that i wrote for power up is about the importance of secret identities <laughs> and so people maintaining your secret, you, you maintaining your secret identity. I don't want to know who Dr. Man is. And somehow that'll, if I find out that he, that uh, Peter Parker is, is Spider-Man, that this is like, that's just, he's just a kid. He's barely older than my son as the guy says in <laughs> Spider-Man too. Right. And how am I supposed to trust this guy? But the idea that maintaining that air of mystery, but the, the educational value of humor, the educational value of complicated stories, the educational value of even sort of unusual things is, um, uh, is is a is something that'll keep us coming back thinking about about leadership. And so I encourage uh, those of you out there watching, right? Power up available from Casemate Publishers. Uh, too boldly go also still available. Am I correct? Too boldly go is in paperback too, or are they both still in hardback? I'm not. I won't, um, I won't I go out on a limb on I, that. I'm pretty sure it's in paperback. Uh, I also know that that one is also available on audio as well as Kindle. Uh, I have not listened to the audio book. Um, I'm always afraid of who's going to read these things and what they're going to sound like. You know, are you going to sound like Gilbert Gottfried when you're reading the book? Please no. Please um, but they're available. Widely right. available. But I think it is in paperback. So I think I saw that it was a fairly low price. Good. Widely available. Check them out. Steve Leonard, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights on leadership here on People Politics Pros. It's been it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Ron. And FPRI thanks our sponsors and partners for their generous support that makes programs possible like this one. We ask you that if you have enjoyed our conversation today, which was really just the beginning, please tell a friend, bring a friend next time. Please consider becoming an ally, uh, uh, sponsor, partner, uh, secret super friend of FPRI so that we can continue to uh, produce these kinds of shows. If you really enjoyed this kind of discussion. Um, we hope that you will come back again next time. To keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose and other events at FPRI, visit our website, fpri.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or X, depending on uh, somebody's new secret identity. And you can follow the host of this program on X at Ronald Granary. Um, we look forward to welcoming you again. And so until next time, for all of us at FPRI, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us.